All right. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. I just put the link to the slides in the chat so you can check out the resources we have there. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about hypothesis multimedia features and using them in conjunction with universal design for learning in your course. And we'll talk about what universal design for learning is as well, if that's not something you're familiar with. Um, so to start off, I just want to review our agenda really quickly. We'll start out with talking about what social annotation is and what UDL is. Um, again, just to make sure we're all kind of on the same base level. And then I'll dive in more into how social annotation can help you meet the principles of universal design for learning in your course. Uh, and we'll provide some uh, assignment examples. It says demo at the end here. We actually won't be doing a demo today because you all are likely using different learning management systems and that can look different in different systems. Um, so I will just provide an explanation of where you can find more information about how to use hypothesis in your courses. I think most people have introduced themselves in the chat. If you haven't put your school and where you're from in the chat, if you could share with us now, that would be great. Um, and I'm also just going to ask in a poll what your experience with hypothesis is. It seems that Zoom changed where the polls are. So it just took me a second to find that. Uh, but if you could take my poll for me, that would be great. Uh, just again, to see kind of where everyone, um, what experience level everyone's coming in at. Okay. Looks like almost everyone has answered, and we actually have a bunch of hypothesis professionals here. Um, so it looks like most people have used hypothesis before. So what I'll do is, since we're going to be talking about hypothesis multimedia features today, I'll specifically go over what hypothesis and social annotation looks like over a YouTube video, because we just introduced YouTube annotation in August, and maybe not all of you have at least seen the YouTube feature before. So thanks for taking the poll. Um, and so my name is Christy DeCarolis. Uh, I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis. I run a lot of our professional development offerings like this training. My background is in instructional design. I've been doing faculty support and instructional design for about the last 10 years. And I also teach with Hypothesis in my own course. I'm so excited to have you here today. I do wanna start with what it looks like to annotate with Hypothesis. Like I said before, most of you seem to be pros in that you at least know what hypothesis is. Um, so we'll actually just look at a um, a YouTube video annotation, uh, just because, like I said, that might be new. So what hypothesis lets us do with a now with YouTube videos in addition to documents is it will let us annotate the transcript of a video um, alongside the video as it plays. So if I play the video here, it'll show up on the left. I have it muted so it doesn't talk over me, but normally you'd also hear the video. Um, and the transcript is in the center here. Um, so the, the narration will actually follow like the transcript as it's going. So the transcript will auto scroll as you see it doing now. And if I wanted to add an annotation to that, I could um, click on the pause button to pause the video. I could select the text that I'd like to annotate like you would with any other hypothesis document and click that annotate uh, button. So I'll, I can add an annotation, post it, and then I can hit play again to continue on with the video. Um, so the video annotation functionality works very similar to annotating a more traditional text-based document. Um, if I wanted to jump to a particular area of the transcript that has been annotated, I could click on that. Um, or I can click on text in the transcript to jump to that part of the video. 
So I think there's a lot of opportunity here for students, if you have lecture videos especially, to take notes that can help them when they're reviewing for an exam or when they're preparing for a written assignment. Because I don't know if you all have been there. I hate when I... <laughs> as a student or someone who is watching a video, know that something was talked about in the video and I can't find it again. So students can use the annotation to perhaps make a note of when important things have been discussed um, so they can easily jump back to that portion of the video later on. So that's kind of the basics of what it looks like to annotate with hypothesis. In this case, students could be watching the video in isolation on their own uh, but annotating all together. So everyone in the class could be adding annotations and engaging with this video um, on their own, but together at the same time. Um, so yeah, Susan asks if this is compatible with TED Talks as well. Um, so hypothesis um, is using only YouTube URLs for now. Most TED Talks I think are on YouTube, so you should be able to access um, the YouTube version, uh, but we are hoping to expand our video streaming offerings um, later on. So I'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. Um, paired hypothesis, we like to say that it makes reading and now watching videos more active, visible, and social. Um, so I like to emphasize the active part because I think that students often are not in asked to engage in metacognition when reading. Like we all kind of hope that they're doing that, but sometimes students forget that they should be doing that. Or maybe they haven't ex been explicitly taught how to metacognitively engage with a text, um, which can help with their retention and comprehension. So they asking them to annotate the, um, the text or the video is asking them to think about what kinds of questions do I have? How do I connect this to my real life? How do I connect this to things I have learned before in my course? It'll make reading and, and video watching more visible to us as instructors because we can see where students might be confused about the video or maybe what parts, you know, they're really um, connecting with or really resonating with them if that is more heavily annotated. And Anecdotally, I hear from my students that they like the social aspect of hypothesis the most, that seeing the classmates' annotations um, helps them better understand what they're reading or what they're viewing. Um, and seeing other people's questions can also help identify um, that they're not the only ones that feel confused about a topic. So I want to start out because we're going to be looking at multimedia and hypothesis specifically and through the lens of Universal Design for Learning or UDL. Um, and there's a nonprofit called CAST, like it's an acronym, C-A-S-T, uh, that created the UDL framework and they define UDL as a tool used in the implementation um, of universal design for learning. And the framework is to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on how people learn. I like to just think of it as how do we meet students where they are and ensure that our courses meet the needs of all students, um, no matter if they learn best through reading or through watching something or through looking at an image. Um, I do see the question in the chat about the video transcript, so I will get to that in just a moment. Um, so UDL has these three principles of, um, of its framework, uh, to provide multiple means of engagement, to provide multiple means of representation, and to provide multiple means of action and expression. And if we kind of implement these three pillars of the framework in our courses, that should help best meet the needs of all learners. And I'm gonna talk about how hypothesis can help us kind of fulfill the, the requirements of each of these pillars, which there are more details of here. I don't wanna get into all the text right now, um, but we'll look at each of these individually. So how can a hypothesis help fulfill these three pillars of universal design for learning? So when we're talking about multiple means of engagement, um, what exactly does that mean? Uh, basically, it's asking us to think about what are different ways that we're motivating students to participate in the course. If we 
are only offering them one way to participate. Maybe it's like raising their hands in class. Not all students are going to want to engage in that way. Um, so we have to think about how can we uh, engage, what are different ways we can engage our students. Um, we can create value and authenticity in our assignments. So our assignments seem like they have meaning. Uh, we should have different levels of challenging assignments. Oh my gosh, I just wanna, I just wanna expand the box, guys. Um, we have different levels of demands for our assignments. And then how can we foster community and encourage self-assessment and reflection in our assignments? Again, to encourage motivation in our students. Hypothesis can help us with this pillar because it offers an alternative way for students to engage. So like I said, not every student is going to want to be like raising their hands and participating in class verbally, but they might want to annotate a text if they have time to think about their thoughts and, and write them down. It offers a way to build community in our classes, and it offers the students the opportunity to see themselves as someone who create knowledge in the class. Um, so for instance, in my class, I teach a gender studies class. Uh, and most of my students are not gender studies majors. They're coming from majors like computer science, or not computer science, uh, criminal justice. I don't know why I just mixed that up. Although I have had a couple computer science majors, um, criminal justice, psychology, uh, health sciences. So they can all bring things to the reading from their other classes that I don't have expertise on. Um, and they can see themselves as experts on a topic. And like I mentioned earlier, they can also make sure that we're engaging metacognition in those self-reflective um, uh, self activities that are required in annotation. Um, social annotation, we also provide some features and hypothesis to support neurodivergent learners um, in the way that we're offering different ways to engage. Uh, and then I just want to also point out some students can find the annotating to be a little bit distracting. So the bottom part of this slide does um, point out how you students can control the distractions. One way is that they can uh, hide the highlights. So they can use this little eyeball icon to turn the highlights on or off if they don't want to see that. So I can always kind of tuck my annotations away and turn the highlights off if I want to read through a fresh page uh, and then toggle those back on when I'm ready. And then if someone has annotated a document since I opened it, there is a um, arrow that'll show up at the top, um, a red circle with a down pointing arrow. If I click on that, it will load in annotations that have been newly added since I opened the document. So if someone's annotating at the same time as me, their annotations are not going to just pop up which can, again, like this extra movement can be distracting. You can choose when to load those in. Um, the next kind of pillar of the UDL framework is providing multiple means of representation for students. And what that means is that uh, we want to look, think about how will students best learn a concept or topic. Not all students will learn a concept best by simply reading about it. Um, so how can we clarify the, the jargon and syntax in a text? What other alternatives can we offer beyond just text, uh, like audio or visuals? And can we highlight patterns for students? Um, so one example that I like to give is of providing multiple means of representation is in this physics text. Um, this one annotation that sometimes I have trouble finding because I have too many annotations here. There's a conversation going on about the law of conservation of momentum. I really scrolled past it again, didn't I? I'm gonna just search. So in this annotation conversation, Jennifer has found the textbook, which kind of tries to uh, define the law of conservation of momentum. And that's something that as a non-physics person, I read that and I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. But if I watch the video about the law of conservation of momentum, then I can better understand that concept when I see it. 
So I think this is a great example about of bringing multiple means of representation right to the text. So the student can read about the law of conservation of momentum while they also are seeing the law of conservation of momentum in a video that's embedded in the annotation. And then kind of the opposite is happening here. So we have the video as one means the main mean of representation that the students are watching. And they can also choose to read through the transcript if they prefer that or read through some of the annotations here. So that multiple means of representation can really help students that might not learn best through just an audio or a visual or a text-based um, resource. Um, so I mentioned the, the YouTube integration. Uh, there are YouTube instructions uh, linked in that slide there if you're not sure how to annotate the YouTube video. Um, and then I did mention, like I, or like I said earlier, having students or yourself add images and video to annotation can really help um, clarify concepts for students and help them better understand what's happening in the text. Uh, I think I also like to really encourage students to add their own multimedia annotations uh, using different and creative ways. Sometimes they don't always jump to adding multimedia to their own annotations, but if I ask them to do something like add a meme to an annotation about the text to create something on their own, I think then the that creativity and the ability to kind of have a more informal conversation around the text can excite students. Um, and that's kind of connecting back to that first pillar of UDL that I mentioned, right? What are different ways we can motivate students to engage with the text? And then finally, the final pillar of UDL is to um, provide multiple means of action and expression. So you can kind of see the learning path here. The first pillar talked about um, how do we motivate students to learn? The second pillar focused on content. How are we providing multiple means of representation to students? And that third pillar is really focusing on how can we assess students best through multiple means? So not all students are going to do well on a test. Not all students are going to do well through a written essay. Um, so how can we provide them with different means of uh, expression to show us what they've learned? Um, and so hypothesis is one way that they could demonstrate what they've learned um, and to emphasize that they uh, can scaffold the process of learning um, and emphasize the process of learning over that final product. So we can kind of see their learning journey. And I have highlighted kind of that here as well. I like hypothesis because it provides students with a space to learn together. Uh, I think sometimes in education, we really focus on these summative assessments where students are proving what they've learned already. Um, but we are ignoring a lot of this learning journey where it's messy and we make mistakes and we don't really know what we're talking about yet because we're learning. Um, so hypothesis kind of provides that safe space where students can try out new ideas and um, be wrong about things sometimes and maybe not worry about like losing points in the process. All right, so... Um, now we can shift over to some of the technical things. Um, I wanted to address Nikki's question in the chat. Are the annotations only for videos with transcripts uh, or closed captioning in transcripts or auto-generated captions? That's a good question. So right now we only work with videos that have an auto, like a, a transcript available in YouTube. If there's a transcript available in YouTube, the video likely also has captions. Those could be auto-generated or they could be manually uploaded. Um, depending on the source, uh, that could impact the transcript. So this is a crash course video. Um, those are pretty professionally made. So I'm guessing that this transcript was is a professional transcript and is correct. Um, the same would probably be for TED Talks. Others who have uploaded their videos, if it's auto-generated, the transcripts might be you know, have some mistakes in them. So that is something to keep to keep, to keep an eye out for. Um, in the future, we do hope to have the capability to um, annotate videos that don't have transcripts because, you know, if you had like an orchestral performance or something that would not have a transcript. Um, but 
at this point, we're just starting with YouTube videos with transcripts. In the future, we also hope to have the ability to annotate from other streaming providers like Kaltura, Pernocto, or something like that, that a lot of schools have partnerships with um, in case you're not loading your videos into YouTube. However, it does work with unlisted YouTube videos. So I know some people will post their videos, like their lecture videos to YouTube, but make them unlisted so they're not publicly searchable. Uh, an unlisted video does work with the annotation feature. So if uh, most of you have used Hypothesis before, you know that Hypothesis has a single sign-on uh, with your learning management system, whether you're using Brightspace, Canvas, Moodle, Sakai, or Blackboard. Um, the students don't have to sign into anything extra, and this YouTube feature will work the same way. Um, they don't have to you know, sign into a new uh, account or go to a third-party website. They're just opening the reading or the video and annotating right in the learning management system. Um, I want to go over just a couple key things in case some folks are not familiar with the things that you can annotate with Hypothesis. Um, so we talked about the YouTube video transcripts. We also now have the capability to annotate JSTOR articles. Um, so your... Um, if your institution, which it likely does, uh, subscribes to JSTOR as a library database, you can grab that URL and use that with students. Um, if you're a vital source independent school, then you can use vital source e-texts. Uh, PDFs would be traditionally the most annotated type of document, and then URLs of public facing websites. And open textbooks and open educational resources tend to either be a PDF or a URL. And then I also wanted to review the, the different things you can add to the annotations because of that multimodal principle of UDL, of providing that multiple means of representation for students. Um, a lot of people kind of forget about this in the annotation piece. So even if you're not having students annotate a video, you can provide the multiple means of representation through the annotations by providing video or image examples. Um, so uh, on top of text, you can embed images, you can embed YouTube or Vimeo videos, um, you can use LaTeX to add equations to annotations, and then external links and tags as well. Um, and there are instructions at the bottom here on how you can add each of those things to an annotation. Um, I think that a lot of faculty I know will go into a document before students have access to it and will add their own annotations. Um, and this could be a great opportunity for you to go in and add clarifying images or videos as well. Um, so there is a theater professor that I have spoken to who um, she teaches in California. It actually might be, I think Nikki is at Cerritos. I think it's a professor at Cerritos, Nikki. Um, and she uh, uses Hypothesis in her, yeah, Francie, her theater course. Um, and she uh, will bring in uh, videos and images and add those to the annotations for students because she teaches plays. The students are reading the plays and those scenes of you know, from YouTube and those images can help them better understand what's happening in the play. So I think that's a great example of incorporating Hypothesis to um, kind of meet those pillars of UDL in your own course by uh, incorporating multimodal uh, representations. If you are using a, a PDF, um, it does have to have a selectable text layer, which is kind of another part of the accessibility piece. Um, so students who um, have some kind of visual impairment, whether that is physical or perhaps a, like a visual processing disorder, often need to use screen readers or some other kind of assistive technology to help them read text. And if the PDFs that you're using in your course don't have a selectable text layer, then they those students cannot access um, those PDFs. They can't read them uh, with the screen reader. So that selectable text layer also has to be used with Hypothesis as well, um, but it's just good accessibility practice. And we actually have a website 
that if you have a document that does not have selectable text, it tends to happen with documents that start out as like a paper document. If you have taken a paper and scanned it in like a home scanner, probably doesn't have selectable text on it. Uh, but this website will allow you to upload your document. I'm going to pop it in the chat. Upload your document. It will add the selectable text layer and you can download it and use it in your class. Um, and so you can use that even if you're not using hypothesis on a document. Just for accessibility purposes, it's a good thing to have in your back pocket. And yes, thank you. She definitely, her hypothesis use is very inspiring. Um, so there are some other resources to help students get started here. Uh, but I wanted to give you all some further ideas on using hypothesis in the classroom. Uh, before I get into that, does anyone else have any thoughts or questions so far? Um, you can pop your comments into the chat or raise your hand and I can give you permission to speak if you'd prefer to unmute. Okay. So um, some ideas on how to incorporate hypothesis into your classroom. Um, you can start by annotating the syllabus. I know at this point in the semester, it's not the best time to do that. But in your back pocket for the next semester, um, you can have students annotate the syllabus as a way to get them engaged and get them testing using hypothesis from the start of the course. Um, we do have here, um, the little pencil icon in the upper right will link to sample instructions if you wanna try that in your course, if you have not done that already. That's how I open every semester in my course. Um, I also really like to have students um, annotate, this is not quite the same, am I? Yeah, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so here you can have students annotate either your course lectures by video, like we saw with the video annotation tool, or you can have students annotate lecture slides that you save as a PDF. Um, so I have worked with a business professor um, that has only annotated lecture slides, has only had his students annotate lecture slides. So I think he uses a traditional textbook, so he can't have, he can't have students annotate the course readings. Um, but they can annotate his lecture slides and they'll tie those lecture slides back into the reading, you know, talk about how the things connect. Um, they'll ask questions about the lectures. And again, it can help provide this multiple means of representation to students. And if they're watching video, add engagement to the video without kind of putting more labor on the front end for you. So I know in the past, especially when I've taught online classes, I'll want to make sure that students are watching the videos. So I'll try to create like quizzes or um, some kind of assessment for them. And I hate coming up with those quiz questions for videos. I just, I always feel like I don't want to direct um, exactly what the students have to get out of that content. And adding the interaction to the video this way kind of opens it up so students can talk about more than just what I'm asking them. Um, you can also just, instead of, I mentioned kind of going in, adding your own annotations to the document, uh, you can leave it open and have students really lead the conversation, depending on your discipline and what kinds of things they're reading, um, that it can really help uh, drive the conversation in the direction students want to go. Um, and I think there's a lot of different creative ways to do this. Um, you could have students share memes. I've seen folks who, if they're asking students to read a poem, have them only annotate with images, don't even annotate with text. So what are different ways can we stretch students' creativity and way of thinking in our annotations? And then finally, um, I like to have my students annotate course documents on top of uh, just their course readings. Um, so for instance, in, um, in the spring of last year, for the first time, I had my students annotating uh, project instructions. And it went really well for me because it helped the students 
make sure they review the instructions beforehand because they had to post a question or help another student answer a question. Um, so they weren't seeing the instructions for the, the first time at the last minute. Um, and they had a record of that Q&A that they could revisit um, when they were actually working on the project. So I actually got a lot more questions about the project than I normally would. And I think that it provided a great space for clarification around what students were doing um, before they were handing the project in. So we have lots of examples of starter assignments here. Um, so basically these are just uh, sample instructions that you can use for your own course. Um, so if you want to use them as they are, or you want to adapt them, you know, take out a couple bullets and add in your own, that works as well. Um, you're free to do either one. And that includes a video annotation assignment, sample instructions to have students annotate a video. So I'm going to paste that into the chat. I think it's really important. Um, I'm not sure if folks that have used social annotation before would agree, but the prompt that you give to students and the instructions that you give to students can really impact the quality of their annotations. If I just tell my students, add three annotations and reply once, um, sometimes their annotations are lacking in depth and meaning. But if I can dig a little bit further and ask them to connect something from the video to something we discussed in class or explain how a concept in the video is connected to something they know in their life, if I kind of give them a nudge to help them understand what a deep and meaningful annotation is, that can really um, impact the quality of the conversation. So feel free to use those examples in your own course. All right, so the only thing left I have today are some reminders of resources for you. Didn't want to keep everyone too long on a Friday. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or thoughts about these hypothesis multimedia features and universal design for learning? Okay, well, just as a reminder, um, we have lots of different resources available to help you uh, expand your usage of hypothesis in your courses. Um, these two bullets, um, liquid margins and the resources for social annotation are assignments um, and other faculty just talking about how they use hypothesis in their courses. So they can be great for inspiration. Um, and then Hypothesis Academy is something that we also run to help folks get started. Um, it offers a hypothesis certified educator credential. They're two week asynchronous courses and we have two topics, uh, social annotation 101 and social annotation in the age of AI that allow you to take a deeper dive into hypothesis and further develop an assignment for your own course. Um, right now we're running social annotation in the age of AI. Uh, we'll be doing a cohort of the 101 course in November and then the AI course we'll be doing fresh in the new year to get us ready for spring. So. Uh, you can check those out and sign up for those uh, at no extra cost if your school is using Hypothesis. And you made it to a partner workshop. This is one of them. Uh, we will have more topics coming as the semester progresses. I believe next week we're talking about grading and feedback for social annotation. So join us on Tuesday if you'd like to uh, check that out or top other topics in the future. And then you can always reach out to us if you need assistance. Um, getting started. So whether that's pedagogical, brainstorming how you might use it in your course, or just technical, like can we set this up together? Uh, please let me know because I would be happy to get you rolling in your own course with using Hypothesis. Um, but I will ask for questions one last time here. And otherwise, uh, I hope that um, you have a great weekend and I'll send out the recording and the slides after the Zoom does its processing thing. So any questions for me today? All right, awesome. Well, thank you again uh, for joining everyone. I appreciate you taking the time and I hope everyone has a great weekend.